He's slowing down today. Is he coming? Come on, Elliot. We're waiting for you. Come on. Kendra will come with you. Oh, got to have mom. <laughs> well, we've been learning about the uh, man who had been born blind uh, last Sunday and this Sunday and next Sunday as well. So he had never been able to see, and uh, last Sunday Jesus saw him, and what did Jesus do for the man? Do you remember, from, are any ideas what he could have done? Remember Jesus, he saw the man, and did it, Jesus spit on the man or spit on the ground? Yeah. He spit on the ground, and then what did he do? He mixed it around and made some clay, some mud there, and then what did he do with the mud? Yeah. Put it on his eyes, and sure enough, Jesus said, you know, you go to the pool of Siloam and wash, and the man, what did he do? I don't think that's going to work. Is that what he did? No. He, he took off. He went over to the pool, and he washed his eyes, and guess what happened to his, his eyes then? What do you think happened? He could see, plain as day, 2020 vision. And he continued to see as well. Well, some of the um, uh, religious big shots, I like to call them, or we were, for today's uh, purpose, we'll call them the pastors. The pastors in the church there, in the synagogue, they didn't like Jesus, so they brought the man in, and they said, hey, buddy, what do you think about that Jesus? Oh, I, I like him. I think he's a prophet. And do you know what the pastors of the church did? We call them the, the Jews or the Pharisees, or the scribes, the Sadducees. You know what they did when they found out that this man trusted Jesus, believed in Jesus? What do you think? No, they didn't kill him. They threatened him. Yeah, you know how they threatened him? They threw him out. Okay, buddy, you're going to trust in this Jesus. We're going to throw you out the door. They probably grabbed him by the neck or the shirt and pulled him out and threw him out of church. Can you believe it? Well, we're going to be looking at, the, at that blind man today, or I shouldn't call him blind man, formerly blind man, and notice how he, he just makes these incredible statements about a man he didn't really know that well. But it's just so wonderful to uh, uh, learn this account of this man, all right? So you think about that today as we work our way through this uh, formerly blind man, all right? Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this uh, formerly blind man who's going to teach us some lessons today and some things for us to, uh, to look at and to maybe follow his example as well. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, don't go back quite yet. Get you a snack before you go back home. Or back home, yeah. Back to church. Okay, so, yeah. Elliot gets that one. All right, so dig in there and grab one. We're going to get one for Mom and CJ, too. There you go. All righty. So take your Bibles and turn there to... Uh, John 9. We're just going to keep working our way through the uh, chapter 9 here as we scoot along through uh, John chapter 9. So I was curious, in your lives here on this earth, ha has there ever been a time where you met somebody just very briefly and yet you thought to yourself, there's a unique individual. There's a talented person or they're a special person. Uh, maybe you can think back in your times where that's happened to you. And uh, that's kind of what's happening here today with this uh, formerly blind man. We learned last Sunday that uh, this uh, blind man, he had been blind from birth. He had never been able to see. And what I learned two things this week that I didn't know last week. One I didn't catch and one I didn't know. 
This blind man, as he sat there and was begging, that Jesus saw him. Okay. One of the things I didn't notice, and I caught it again, or I caught it this week here now, when I was looking at this, when you look at the neighbors and those who saw him, and the Pharisees, and John calls them the Jews, kind of a, it's a, a hostile word that he uses for them because they're hostile towards Jesus. The, the other groups, the neighbors, uh, those who formerly saw him, and uh, the Pharisees, and I just used the word, the, the pastors of the day is an expression we might use. They were uncertain who he was. No, I don't think it's him. It just looks like him. No, maybe it's, maybe it's his twin brother. You know, they weren't really totally sure if it was him or not. They could clearly see that he could see, but they were not totally sure if it was him or not. And I thought about that uh, this past week here now. And why didn't they know him? Why weren't they 100% sure if it was him or not? They ought to have. He was a beggar. Hey, let's call him Earl. Earl, let's go down to Mel's Diner and have a, uh, hot cakes and um, turkey bacon and cinnamon roll and orange juice. Let's go have breakfast. Let's get to know each other. And uh, maybe the neighbors could have taken him out for dinner and they could have had um, chili uh, with cheese on it. And then they could have uh, ordered uh, Rice Krispies, not Rice Krispies bars, uh, Honey Nut Cheerio bars, is that what they call them? Could have had a snack. And they could have got to know him, but they really kind of ignored him when they really shouldn't have. They really should have known him very well. He'd been blind from birth. He most likely didn't have a job. He was uneducated, all this, these things but yet they're, well, I'm not really sure if it's him or not. I thought about that in my own life. We should really get to know people like that and know them well. People who need, uh, a, need a friend or who need a meal or whatever it might be. And so I was kind of thinking about that in their uncertainty of knowing him. Okay, And then also one of the things I learned this week here, last week we talked about Jesus um, spitting in the ground and stirring it around and putting the mud on his eyes. What I didn't realize <clears throat> was that um, according to the Pharisees, you know, they had more rules and regulations added to the scriptures than you could shake a stick at. And they held to these exceedingly dearly. Well, one of the things that they had stuck in there was you can't knead on Sunday or the Sabbath or at that time. You can't make, make bread. You, you can't do this motion. Or in other words, you can't take a stick and stir up mud. Maybe, is that one of the reasons why Jesus did that? To say, fellows, this is foolishness. That, that's an added rule to the scriptures that I never put in there. It's okay to spit on the ground and make mud. That's very possible. And so he's pinpointing them in their... Uh, they're thinking that it was wrong. So, I mean, that's a very real possibility as well. And so we get to our passage for today. One of the first things I'd like for us to look at here uh, this morning is the man's prophet. The man's prophet, not, not this kind of prophet, uh, like a pastor, the man's uh, prophet, all right? So, you'll notice in our scripture passage there, so we've uh, covered the first 12 verses, the man can see, and then you notice in verse 12, uh, they said to him, where is he? I don't know where he is. I've never even seen him. I don't know where he is, okay? Now, in verse 13, between 12 and 13, uh, it's possible that there's a, a, a gap in time, or there's a, maybe a few hours, maybe even a, a day or two that has passed by, uh, just the way the, the sentences are written here. So one of the things I was curious about, notice in verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Okay, they brought him. 
Who is the they? Who is it that's bringing this formerly blind man to the Pharisees? Through the people who had added all this uh, nonsense, or I shouldn't call it nonsense, well, maybe we could call it nonsense. All these extra rules and regulations to the Scripture that Jesus never intended. Well, I don't think it's the neighbors. You, you know, you just go back ahead of the context. You have the neighbors and those who formerly saw him, and then you also have the, the Pharisees or the Jews. Okay? I don't really see that the neighbors would have any reason to bring him to the Pharisees, because most likely the neighbors really didn't care for the Pharisees either. Those who formerly saw him, jumping back to uh, verse 8 there, maybe it's them. And then maybe it's the Jews. There's people that are other Pharisees or other people connected to them. And I was curious about that because John leaves they um, kind of vague or um, sort of undefined. And it's possible the reason he's doing that is to carry the idea that they're up to no good. These people are up to no good by bringing the formerly blind man to the Pharisees. Okay? It's, not, it's not likely that there's something positive about this. Hey, Pharisees, you should really see this. Because once you saw this, you too would believe in Jesus. So I don't think there's something positive about it. And so that's maybe why John leaves it. They brought him. Okay? So they brought the man to the Pharisees. So it's a good possibility that the Pharisees have um, been stirring this around. We need to get this taken care of. We can't let this go on, this Jesus stuff and doing the things like this and this blind man. Uh, I don't know. Larry Curly and Moe, go get him. Bring him over here. And so that's probably what's taking place. And so they go and get him, this man who was formerly blind. Okay. Now we notice in the scriptures here that it was the Sabbath day. And here's where I learned that this week, that maybe what Jesus was doing, he was kneading mud on purpose and showing these Pharisees, this is okay. It's okay to knead some mud together and put it on the man's eyes so he can go and see I mean, Jesus could have done it a different way, but that's the way he chose to do it. Okay? And as I noted last Sunday, uh, the man never forgot it. Okay? So that's some thoughts of that as well. So it was the Sabbath day that Jesus made clay and opened the man's eyes. Okay? So notice in verse 15, the Pharisees, they're also asking him, well, how did you receive your sight? So he says to them, and notice he keeps it short, simple, and brief. Most likely this man here as well, as you catch through his answers, uh, he knows you don't want to tell, tell them too much. And so he keeps it brief with them. He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. You know, it's possible, as I noted earlier, that there might be a, a few hours or maybe a, a day or two or you know, just exactly how much time. I don't know for sure. But notice what he says. He applied clay to my eyes, I washed, and I see. And it carries the idea that I am still seeing. It wasn't just a momentary 10-second uh, thing. I could see for 10 seconds. I can still see. In fact, I see you fellows right now. I still see. Okay? So it's indicating that Jesus' miracle is done well, done perfectly, done completely, because he still is seeing. All right, so we noticed that. Therefore, the Pharisees, some of them were saying, well, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Here's where our division starts coming in for our title of the message today. The other Pharisees, they said, well, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And there was a great division among them. So you had some Pharisees over here who would say, well, he's a sinner. There's no way he could do things like this. Or their expression is, he broke the Sabbath. He broke our rules and regulations. He's a sinner. So therefore, he must have used magic or this Jesus and this formerly blind man, they're in cahoots with each other. 
Something's fishy about it. There's no way possible that this sinner could do this. And so that's the group over there. The other group over here says, oh, wait a minute. Uh, it, it, that's not possible either, because how is it possible that a sinner can open the eyes of the blind? And so they're divided. Is it? Well, and they don't know what to do. This, this stumps them, these religious leaders, highly educated religious leaders are stumped. And they're puzzled by that. Okay. And so, one of the things to, to note here is that when people are unclear, or they, I shouldn't see it that way, when people don't want to believe in Jesus, guess what comes in? Division. When there's unbelief and, and hatred towards him, the natural thing that follows is going to be division. And that's what's happening here with these uh, uh, Jews. Okay, So, they said to the man, blind man again, what do you say about him? I have one translation I came across. Uh, it's phrased it this way. Well, you're the expert. What do you think? How did he open your eyes? And so you have these, this is just fascinating. Here's a man who has never seen he has never seen Jesus. He's never seen the Scriptures. He's heard them, probably, as a good possibility. The religious leaders are highly trained in the Scriptures, and yet they're looking to the um, formerly blind man. Well, you're the expert. What do you think? What do you think is taking place? Do you find that striking? It's astounding. They ask him, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And then the man, he spits this out. He is a prophet. And so you could ask yourself this question. How does he know that? How does this uh, formerly blind beggar know that Jesus is a prophet? He's never seen him. He, he's heard what, though? He's heard the word. Go to the pool and slow and wash. Okay? And so... The hearing of the word has, and the Spirit of God has generated this in this man's heart. There's no doubt in my mind he's a prophet. That is the power of the word of God. These Jews, they reject that. In their hardness of heart, they say, no, we're not letting that penetrate our hearts. But this man did. Also by saying that he's a prophet, he's getting himself in the hot seat with these Jews who run the synagogue. He just said something that, that uh, got their dander up. The, back of the, the hair on the back of their neck were... What did he just say? They didn't like that. Okay? So he said it anyways. His courage is incredible. It's, it's impressive. Okay? So that's what he says to them. Which will bring us to our second thought. So we notice the man's pr uh, prophet. Now we're going to notice the man's parents. So the Jews, they did not believe it of him. So you catch that word? They did not believe. All right. Well, somebody had a bright idea. Go get his parents. This should solve it. So they go get his parents, and uh, the parents come in, and they show the parents, hey, is this your son? How did he see you? Da, 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 da. All these questions. And the parents, they say, yep, that's our son. You'll catch it in the verses to follow there. Is this your son? Do you say he was born blind? How does he now see? And the parents, they said this in verse 20. We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Who opened his eyes? We don't know that either. Ask him. He is of age. He's old enough. He can talk for himself. And so the Parents come in and they say, yep, yeah, that's our boy. He was born blind. How he sees, who did it, we, don't no we know nothing. Ask him. He can speak for himself. It's possible then that there's something a little suspicious about that. Because you'll notice in the following verse, how truthful are they being? I'm not 100% sure that they're being totally accurate with the Pharisees or the Jews as they listed them there. 
Because notice what verse 22 says. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. So they formulated their answer as they were being questioned by the Jews. They formulated their answer because they were afraid of them. Because the Jews have already said, if you claim Jesus, you're on his side, out the door you go. We're chucking you out of here. And so the parents, they didn't want that. They didn't want, uh, maybe they had some kind of a role in the synagogue or some connection. Whatever it is, they were afraid of the Jews. They are, were afraid of linking themselves to Jesus. And so they say, well, you ask him. Okay. One of the things to note out of that is that sometimes, sometimes it happens that when you come to the side of Jesus, he is a prophet. I am associating with him. I believe in him. Sometimes people abandon you. That does happen occasionally. Okay? But the man did it anyways. He was going with Jesus. Regardless if his parents came along or not, he kept on going. And I think that's a word of encouragement for us as well. So I would encourage you today, wherever you find yourself in life, uh, go with Jesus, whether your parents or whether your friends or family, whether they follow you or not, keep going with Jesus, okay? Which is what this man does here, okay? That would bring us to our third thought, the man's preaching. The man's preaching, right? So as you scoot a little further on here, you'll notice in verse 24, so a second time they called the man who had been uh, blind, and they said to him, Give God the glory. We don't know, we know that this man is a sinner. At least that's what they thought. And some said, no, he can't be, and here's this division coming back in. So the man, he says this. He says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I have no idea. And then he says what he does know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Okay? So what's fascinating out of this here is that this man who was formerly blind, who has interacted with Jesus now, who is sticking with Jesus, he sees. But the scribes and the Pharisees who do not listen, who live in unbelief, they still cannot see. Isn't that fascinating? The man, he told him, I've already told you, but you would not listen. You catch it in verse 27. I told you already, but you did not listen. Okay. That was their main problem. They were unwilling to listen, unwilling to hear. But notice what happens in verse 27. Today in uh, Confirmation, we're going to be studying uh, law and gospel. So there's a little bit of law in here, you did not listen. And then there's this beautiful gospel that this man says here in verse 27. Why do you want to hear it again? It's like he, this man, he has a little glimmer of hope. Uh, we sang that song, I love to tell the story. In fact, I love to tell it again and again of what Jesus has done for me. And the man says, you want to hear it again? You want to hear the story again? How many have heard the same story more than once? How many of you like Charlie tell the story more than once? Does that ever happen, Charlie? Yeah. My grandpa did that. He would tell the st same story many, many times, but it was always good. Okay? So the man thinks to himself, hey, they want to hear it again. Because do you want to be disciples too of his? He thinks to himself, you know, they're really hostile, but just maybe, just maybe, they want to become his disciples too. And he becomes a missionary. He's an evangelist. A man who has never seen before. A man who has only met Jesus um, by hearing him and having Jesus touch him. He has never met Jesus. He has never seen Jesus. And yet he says, would you like to be his disciples too? Wonderful. Wonderful. Guess what they did? Yeah, we would love to be Jesus' disciples too. How can we do it? 
Nope. Because they would not listen, because they would not believe. Notice what they did in verse 28. They reviled him, or they made fun of him. You. They hated him. And they said, you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. The man, who had been formerly blind, what he does next and throughout this is just so wonderful. One of my commentators, uh, Lenski, he, he notes this. He phrases it, phrases it this way. The harder they press him, the brighter he shines. The, the more upset they get with him, the more angry they get at him, the rougher they are with him, the brighter he shines. The greater his testimony. And it's it's starting here. It just keeps on growing. Notice what he says in verse 30. The man answered and said to them, Well, here's an amazing thing. This is incredible. This is totally incredible that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. This formerly blind man, blind beggar, he, he recognized it right away. The man opened my eyes. He's a prophet. But the spiritual blindness of the Jews, we don't know where he's from. Well, that's totally amazing. This is incredible. He opened my eyes. Nobody has ever heard of that, not since the beginning of time. You should know where he's from. He's God. Okay. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind person if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. In these wonderful, wonderful, great theological truths are coming out of a formerly blind man, blind beggar. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's just beautiful, okay? That God would use you and me as he opens our eyes to the truth of who He is, as we believe His Word, listen to His Word, that we might have an interest in reaching lost people like this blind beggar, even if to those who are very hostile to the Scriptures and to Jesus. Okay? So notice what they did for the man. He told them uh, he has to be God. No. They said, you're right, buddy. Let's go out for coffee. Not a chance. You know, they, the man with brilliance beyond brilliance, yet with the simplest of simplicity, declared the truth to them, and they had to recognize, you know, he's right, but we still hate you. He's right, but we still want, will not believe, and so guess what they did? Grabbed him by the shirt and poof, kicked him out of church. Says they, um, where did I see that? Oh, the verse 34, sorry. So they put him out. Or, or, yeah, I had to look real twice. They threw him out. And so I was looking then at that. And oftentimes, when there's this great revelation of the truth, through this man's simplicity. The, the scriptures are plain and revealed, and the truth is there, and there's still this rejection of it. This is what can happen. Hatred and, and abuse and, and being mean to those who do believe. Okay? It just gets worse as they follow through there. And so the scriptures are they're given to us here to encourage us today, encourage us, us to believe to have Jesus as our prophet, prophet, priest, and king. He's God. And to recognize that just as this man does here. So that as we work our way through this here, we're going to catch next Sunday that Jesus found him. And that's good news as well. Lord, we thank you for these words that you've given to us. Thank you for uh, continuing to teach us about who you are, how you change lives, and we ask, Lord, that you would just use these words to speak to our hearts here this very morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we continue our service, as we prepare for our closing hymn, that's going to be 251. Shall we all rise for our Lord's Prayer as we uh, prepare to close our service? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, 251. 251.